Good morning. Take your copy of God's Word and open it to the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts for the next uh, many, many weeks uh, together um, as we walk verse by verse through this uh, letter that was given to us uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to read it to you. We'll pray and then we'll jump in. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, it says, In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he, had, he was taken up and he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days in speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus whom you have taken, who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. God, we love you and Lord, we praise you. We thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we pray this morning that you would encourage us, uh, that we would love you more as a result of our time together. Uh, but God, I'm asking uh, this morning uh, that you would help charge us on as a church uh, to do the uncomfortable things, to continue to build your kingdom together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Acts is a unique letter. Uh, it is written by Dr. Luke. Uh, we know that Dr. Luke is a doctor because Colossians tells us as much. As a matter of fact, there are only three places in all of the New Testament that tell us anything about Luke, and they are incredibly vague. The most important bit of information that we probably get is that he traveled with the Apostle Paul. Uh, so as Luke would go around, he would travel with Paul. He would watch Paul in his preaching. He would record the things that Paul would say. Uh, he was a companion and dear friend to the apostle Paul. Uh, but maybe most importantly to Paul, he was a doctor. Uh, Paul needed a doctor, it seemed like, a lot because he was always getting beaten or rocks thrown at him. And Luke was always there for him. Luke writes to us the gospel of Luke, and that gospel is profoundly important because it gives us maybe one of the most detailed records of the life and the ministry of Christ. Here in this note that we have, or this letter that we have, we really have the second edition. We have part two, if you will, of the gospel of Luke. Both Luke and the gospel of Acts, if you will, both start the same way. They are both dedicated to a brother by the name of Theophilus. We're not sure who Theophilus is, but we can gather enough information to assume that he is some sort of wealthy Roman official who worked with Dr. Luke in all of his ministry, and more than likely, he probably funded Dr. Luke in his writing. Luke writes to us a great deal in the New Testament, as a matter of fact. If you take the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts and you put all the words together, there's actually more information there and more words there than all of the apostle Paul's writing in the New Testament. I also believe that Luke wrote the book of Hebrews. And so if that is true, Luke wrote by far the most information in the New Testament and wrote over half of the New Testament that we have in front of us. Dr. Luke recorded an incredible record to give us the timeline or the history of God's moving in creation under the new covenant. What we gather by looking at Acts in the first couple of chapters specifically, especially chapter two, which we'll get to in a few moments, or not in a few moments, in a few weeks, is that Luke makes it very clear that the old covenant is now come to a conclusion and the new covenant is now beginning. You probably remember in the Old Testament under the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31 verses 31 through 34, where the prophet tells us that there is coming a day 
When God would make a new covenant with his people, it wouldn't be like the old covenant where he grabbed them by the hand and drugged them out of Egypt as if he was some sort of husband to them. But this new covenant would be bound on their hearts, bound in their lives. We know Jesus as he's celebrating the Last Supper, instituting communion, which we just celebrated a few moments ago. We know as Jesus is doing that, he tells them that he is instituting a new covenant, prophecy being fulfilled. And Dr. Luke picks up on that. And in his recording of the second part of his gospel, he essentially says, the old has come to a conclusion. Behold, through the blood of Christ, the new covenant is now beginning. Dr. Luke's recording to us in the book of Acts is threefold. He talks about the ascension of Christ, which we look at this morning for a few moments. He talks about the birth of the new church, and ultimately he leaves us hanging with the apostle Paul in a Roman prison. Now we know that the book of Acts was not written very late. It was more than written, more than likely written in about 60 AD. The reason we know that is because the apostle Paul is still alive. Luke is very detailed in his writing and there's no way he would have not recorded the death or the martyrdom of the apostle Paul. So we know more than likely he wrote this while Paul was still in prison in Rome in about 60 AD. And also he never mentions that Jerusalem has been burned to the ground yet, which happened in around 70 AD. So this early writing is... Uh, given to us to give a very brief synopsis of the birth of the church. What's so important about it is what we read all takes place in about 30 years. All 28 chapters of the book of Acts take place in about 30 years. And if you, you, you might think of 30 years and think, man, that's a really long time. Maybe you're 30 years old, but really in the grand scheme of things, it's not very long at all. I mean, you have to think that Christianity did not exist at all. And the only people who were followers of Christ were 11 brothers, which became 500 brothers, which happened during the 40 days, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And by the time Christ in 40 days goes into heaven, by the end of the book of Acts, the gospel has gotten all the way to Rome and is the fastest growing religion in the world. Why is that? Timid fishermen, fearful tax collectors, Women who are minding their own business all of a sudden are willing to become martyrs so that the gospel can get to every people group, to every nation? Well, there's one reason for that. It's because they saw with their own eyes, they dined and they ate with the risen Christ. What we have before us is our history. We have our history before us because our church is not 140 years old. It is 2,000 years old. Yes, our church has been gathering here in Lakeland specifically for around 140 years, but our history is about 2,000 years strong, and it is found here in this book as we read of our brothers and sisters in Christ in what they did to get the gospel to us. So, as we look at this for the next few moments, I want to answer four questions. Um, as we look at the text, I've just kind of drawn out four questions for us to look at that will help guide us over the next many weeks together. But I wanna make one more observation, and this is an observation I will also make at the end, and that is this. While this letter is often called, times called the Acts of the Apostles, it is probably better to call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Luke is very clear in his theolo theological synopsis of his letter that the Holy Spirit is front and center of everything that happens. Forty times, forty times, forty times Luke mentions the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, 20 sermons are actually recorded in the book of Acts, and all 20 sermons are empowered by the Spirit of God. And so as we look at this book, we must understand as it is telling us about the church, what it is ultimately telling us is what God can do through his church as the church is obedient to him. So four questions that govern us. The first question is this, what is a church? 
That's a very simple question, right? What is a church? We, we oftentimes think of the church in the context of uh, its history. Our church is 140 years old, so we think of it in the context of history. But the reality is our church is not 140 years old. It is 2,000 years old, which I mentioned to you a few years ago, uh, several churches back with this church uh, in Israel. Uh, we had come to the end of the week, and a brother was with me who was very fascinated with how old everything was. Uh, everywhere we went, how old is that? How old is that? How old is that, right? And so Hannah, our guide uh, on that trip, uh, was getting a little annoyed, right? Like it's just like a, it's like a, you know, endless, you know, like a child, right? Like how old is that? Just constantly answering how old things are, right? And so we come to the very last day. We're walking down the Via Della Rosa on the way to the garden tomb. And there was a column uh, that's there. I've passed it many, many times. It's there on the Via Della Rosa. It looks really important. It's a column. It's in the middle of the road. And so this brother says, how old is that column? It was like the last chance he got, right? How old or something? And she kind of smirked and rolled her eyes at him. He said, no, how old is it? And she said, well, it's only 500 years old. Now, in context, our country is not 500 years old, right? When you go to Israel, everything there is antiquities, Everything is thousands of years old. So a 500-year-old column is like somebody built it yesterday to them, right? And so it wasn't ancient at all. It wasn't antiquities. It was something that was new. And the reality is when we talk about the church, what we have to understand is when we talk about the church, we are not talking about something that somebody came up with, some weird idea that maybe somebody had 100 years ago. This is 2,000 years of human history. We are standing on the shoulders of brothers and sisters in Christ who gathered together in assembly to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So what is the church? Well, I'll give you a little nerd alert for a few moments. This kind of stuff is what gets me kind of jacked up in my personal study, but it doesn't translate very well, but I do it anyway this morning uh, for you. What is the church? Well, when we read the Greek New Testament, we come, when we come to the English word church, we come in the Greek, in the original language, we, we come to a word called ekklesia. You, you've seen that before, right? Uh, ekklesia is where we would say we get the word church, but that's really not exactly true. Uh, the word ek means called out. Uh, the word uh, kaleo means a group of people who have been called out. So ekklesia. Uh, in other words, what we define in reading the original language is that the church is a bunch of called out people. It's not a place. It's not 1010 East Memorial Boulevard. It's not a place at all. As a matter of fact, it's just a group of people that have been called out. And so what we know when we study church history and when we look at the book of Acts, which we'll see, uh, is that the church has always been a group of people who identify collectively together together under the strong conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and that he is alive. That's the church. But you may ask, well, where does the word church come from? Well, it's quite interesting. Again, nerd alert, right? The word church and ecclesia don't really go together. Uh, they mean two different things. Church actually means a place. It's really not that great of a translation, although it's not wrong to say church. The word church comes from a German word, ersch, K-I-R-C-H-E, ersch, uh, which was derived at some point during the Dark Ages. During the Dark Ages, the Roman Catholic Church, in a desire to overpower people, needed to centralize their power. And so in order to centralize their power, they devised uh, these giant, magnificent buildings. They were called ersch, uh, which meant church. It was a place where the people had to go, the poverty-stricken people especially, give their indulgences, and the Pope just reigned over them. He was in charge of everything, right? So the word church actually is derived during the Middle Ages or from the Dark Ages from a German word, which means a place. However, when William Tyndale, during the Reformation, this is vitally important to our church history, when William Tyndale was translating the Bible into modern language, English, so we could actually read it, it was during that time that he noticed that. 
The, the translation said ursh or it said church. And he said, well, that's not an accurate translation of what the Bible actually says. So in William Tyndale's original uh, translation, every time the word ecclesia came up, he did not translate it as church. He translated it as a congregation of people. Um, this caused him a lot of problems because he was going against the Roman power structure or the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church's power structure. So what do you think they did? They, they made a very rational decision and they burned him alive. That's what they did because they were crazy. You're not gonna teach people that we don't have all the power, so we're not gonna put up with this. So they burned him alive. And you may remember William Tyndale during the Reformation while he's being burned alive, his very last words were, Lord, open up the King of England's eyes. Hence, we have the 1611 King James Version Bible. Brothers and sisters, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about a place. We're talking about a people a people who gather around the core conviction that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose from the dead, and he is Lord of all. That's why, as a church, I have no problem talking about starting campuses in all types of places because it's not about a location. It's about a people. If you went to Africa today, you might find a people on the Lord's Day gathered under an oak tree are gathered in some hidden corner of a house. Why? Because it's about a people. That's what the church is. And what we see in the text in Acts chapter one very quickly, before we even get to the pouring out of the spirit at Pentecost, is there is a group of people that are longing and waiting for God to move and work. He's already appeared to them for 40 days. He's about to ascend into heaven and they're longing for him to work. They have no physical building to meet in. As a matter of fact, they're back in Jerusalem in the upper room. They don't even know where to go, but they're a core group of people who believe that Jesus Christ lived, that he died, that he rose from the dead. And oh, by the way, they're about to believe he is ascending into heaven and coming back for them. This is what the church is. A group of people who gather around the conviction that Jesus Christ is king. The second question is, what is our message? Well, verses one through four address that for us. In verses one through four, it says, in the first book, O Theophilus, referring to the gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. So he reiterates that right here, that he talks about the ministry and the life of Christ. Do and teach until the day that it was he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering, referring to the cross, by many proofs appearing to them for 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So we get this idea that while Christ was uh, with them for 40 days after his resurrection, he appeared according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 to over 500 people while he was appearing to them. He taught them again about all that he had done during his life, during his earthly ministry for 33 years. And he was preaching to them about a coming kingdom, which makes perfect sense when we get to verse seven of chapter one. So, Dr. Luke records, as he did in his gospel, that Jesus Christ preached a very specific message, and it would be this message that these early apostles and Christians would preach to the world. And what was that message? Well, that message was that Jesus Christ really did live. He really did die. He really did rise from the dead. He really did appear to over 500 people for 40 days, and he really did ascend into heaven. History reminds us that Christianity is not built on man's speculation or some crazy person's wild idea. I mean, that would make no sense, right? If you were gonna create a story that would take worldwide fame and, and, and cause people to give their lives for it, you wouldn't draw up some silly story about a carpenter from Nazareth, born of a virgin, which makes no sense at all, living only 33 years, being criminally charged and beaten to death, and then all the disciples who write about it are cowards and they run away. That doesn't make any sense. So the only thing that does make sense is that they recognized that Jesus Christ Christ 
really did die, that he really did rise from the dead, that he really did appear to them and he really did ascend into heaven and therefore he really is coming back. And so therefore they were really excited about that. So they wanted to tell everyone in the world. Now, we're not the first ones to know about this. I mean, as a matter of fact, our church didn't come up with this message. It's given to us in the gospels. As a matter of fact, as early as 140 AD, the Apostles' Creed was written down, if you will. The apostles didn't write down the creed, but they called it the Apostles' Creed because it was the doctrinal statement, the doctrinal statement of the apostles. This creed is written down of what all Christians at all times have always believed. They wrote down these words, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of a virgin, married, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, time out for a moment, not the Roman Catholic Church. The Holy Catholic Church means the church, the universal church the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Since 140 AD, nearly 2,000 years ago, the church has affirmed these core doctrinal truths. Brothers and sisters, our message is grounded in the validity and the truthfulness of God's word. When we... stray from that, we are straying from God himself. We don't have the privilege or the right to manufacture what we believe. God has told us what to believe in his infallible word. For 2,000 years, this has been the case. Now, culturally, we notice in our society how people are changing the meaning of the text. We see churches that have shuttered their doors because they don't believe any longer in the truthfulness of scripture. By the way, when you don't stand on the truth of God's word, you eventually will close down because you're already dead. We don't have the right to pick and choose our message. I'm thankful for that because I don't have to come up with one. The one that is given to us is the one that has authority. It is the one that has the power of salvation. Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of salvation for those who will believe in Romans chapter 10. How will they know unless they hear this powerful message of the gospel? Our message is very simple. Jesus Christ literally came, born of a virgin. He literally lived a sinless life. He literally died on the cross. He literally was buried. He literally came out of the grave. He literally appeared to over 500 people. And those 500 people took the gospel to the end of the earth. And he, oh, by the way, ascended into heaven. And one day he will come back and rescue his church. So a church is a group of people who gather around the core conviction that Jesus Christ is king. And our message is simple. It is laid out to us in the word of God. But a third question is, what is our ministry? That's actually the most simple question that we can ask in the Bible. You know, for years, churches, especially in the 80s and 90s, there was this kind of this trend to, uh, to count all your ministries and be like, well, our church has like 100 ministries and your church only has like 24 ministries, right? Really silly kind of stuff, right? Because the reality is we all only have one ministry. That's actually given to us in the word of God. We actually find it in verse two or in verse one, where uh, in a synopsis fashion, Dr. Luke again repeats as he did in his gospels that he recorded to us so that we would know all that Christ did or all Christ was doing and all that he was teaching. Those two things go hand in hand. As a matter of fact, the most simplistic book in all of the New Testament, really in all of the Bible, is the book of James. And James is famous for saying that we should not just be hearers, although we are to not put aside hearing, we definitely need to hear. But we're not to be hearers only, but also doers. Those two things have always go hand in hand with the gospel ministry. As a matter of fact, there is no gospel ministry without the faithfulness of both doing and practicing gospel amongst people by 
pulling them in and building them up to see Jesus Christ, but at the same time tethering it with the truthfulness of God's word, repent and believe. So while we may have lots of types of ministry, we only have one ministry. That ministry is to love people to Jesus Christ and to speak to them about Jesus Christ. We are to do everything out of love. This is what happened to the disciples, the early church, these brothers and sisters who were sent out. They would take over the world, if you will, not because they would just lecture people and not because they would just do nice things for people, but rather they would live out their faith by practicing their faith on humans, by praying for them, by bearing their burdens, but at the same time, speaking truth and grace in love. This is what we do. This is what the church has always done. This is what it means to be the body of Christ. This is why connect groups are so vitally important in a church our size with 10 services on a Sunday morning, five campuses. It is impossible to even know who attends on a Sunday morning, but in smaller groups, people can bear each other's burdens. They can love each other. They can minister to each other's needs. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. And what's so important about this text is as we get to the end of the text, as it says, I'm writing this so you'll be reminded of everything that Christ did and everything that he taught. By the way, the baton is being passed to you. And we know that because the Bible says that as they were there, they asked the question in verse seven, the same question, or verse six, the same question that you and I would have probably asked if we were there. Lord, does this mean that you're about to establish your kingdom. And he said, probably in Polk County vernacular, it's none of your business. That's what he said. Everybody's interested in when Jesus Christ is gonna come back, except for the fact that when we read the Bible, Jesus always says, it's none of your business. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, how many countless books have been written on the return of Christ and people have wasted their money because the people are always wrong? And Jesus beckons from his word, it's none of your business. Why? Because of what happens next. He's saying, brothers, it's none of your business because you are about to receive power from the spirit of God and you have a mission while I'm away and that is to take the gospel to the nations. And here's what's happened. Here's kind of the culmination of the whole event. The Bible says, as they were standing there Jesus was taken up into heaven and something very important happens that sometimes we miss. A cloud ascended on him and he was gone. That cloud we could trace through the whole Bible. It's first introduced to us in the book of Exodus as this kind of cloud of God, as God's glory was with the people. We come to Daniel chapter seven and we see the cloud of God identifying himself as the son of man referring to Christ. We come to John chapter one, and you know what it says in verse 14? It says that Jesus came down and he tabernacled, literally in the Greek, he tabernacled with his people, which we know in Exodus was surrounded by the cloud of God's Shekinah glory. It was the glory of God. Jesus baptized and the heavens open up and God the Father says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. We come to the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 and what happens there is Peter, James and John are looking on, the cloud of God surrounds the mountain and Jesus Christ is metamorphosed. Everything that is inside shows outside. His deity is pronounced, he is Messiah. We come to the end of his final 40 days and the cloud rests on him once again and he is taken into heaven. And the disciples are like, now what? (laughs) The glory of God has left. In the Old Testament, that was a bad thing. But not now because the promise was you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and now you will be my witnesses. You see, what happened in the ascension was actually the exaltation of Christ. When Jesus Christ went up, he was being exalted. As Philippians tells us that he was a suffering servant when he first came. He was humbled even to the point of death. But now he is highly lifted up. He is at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus Christ lives. He's alive. He's been exalted. And so the ministry of Christ continues, but not in Christ's hands or feet, but rather in what he established as his body, his church. 
The baton was passed at his exaltation as the cloud went up with Christ. And oh, by the way, that same place where Jesus went up on the Mount of Olives, the Bible says he will one day come down again. And Jesus told two stories right before that happened, before his crucifixion. You know the stories, I've gone over them with you, the parable of the minus. The important phrase there in verse two is, you are to occupy and work until I come. The king has gone to a foreign land and you don't know how long he's gonna be away, but one day he will come back because he is king. And when he comes back, he'll reclaim all that is his. You better work or occupy until he's gone, until, he's, until he comes back. And the parable of the talents, the same story is told. Occupy, work until the king goes away. Brothers and sisters, he tells the disciples, it's none of your business. However, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. I will be exalted in this moment. And because I am exalted, one day I will come down. You better get busy in your witness while I'm away. That's the ministry of the church. It's that simple. Whatever we can do to love people to Jesus Christ and show them that they have hope is what we ought to be doing every day. You see, the church isn't about us, is it? It's about Jesus Christ. What's interesting, I was in the eight o'clock service and I think the average age in there is, I don't know, probably 70. I bring it down a little bit, but it's older. And I told them the same thing I tell you. I said, I I need you to, to look at around the room and not get angry, but know that this church has nothing to do with you anymore. It doesn't. We don't make decisions based on the people in the room. That would be foolishness, wouldn't it? I mean, if we made decisions based on the people in the room, what are we gonna do in 15 years if the average age is like 70, 75? No, we make, we make decisions in the room. We make decisions based on those who aren't in the room. Like all of us have grandkids and great-grandkids or whatever, right? Like we wanna see them come to faith in Jesus Christ. What we do is ministry together to pull people in who are still far from God to show them that Jesus Christ has given them hope through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's the ministry of the church. And if that means we have to feed people, if that means we have to sacrifice financially, if that means we have to do this or do that, we are willing to do whatever for the cause of Christ so that someone else may know. And thank God these people did that or we wouldn't be here. That's our ministry. But a final question is this, as we run out of time is, will we continue to witness Verse eight, he says, you will be my witness. We know what a witness is, right? A witness isn't someone who makes up facts, makes up stories. A witness is someone who just gives testimony of what they've seen and heard. These witnesses would give testimony of what they've seen and heard. Did you know that there's no more powerful witness than a life change? No one can ever take away from you what Christ has done in you. Brothers and sisters, Our witness for Christ is not trying to come up with some new information or come up with some fancy formula. Our witness is just simply telling the world what Jesus Christ has already done for us. That's why baptism is so important. It's our public profession of faith. We are demonstrating as first right of obedience that we have died in our sin and the death of Christ, but he has made us new through his glorious resurrection. We are to be witnesses, and I would say two things about that, and I could say much, but we must be ready to suffer if we're to be true witnesses. There is no such thing as we read the Bible of a witness who doesn't suffer. We live in a culture and society where we think that the gospel should bring us all kinds of nice things, but we shouldn't lose anything. But the reality is when we know that Jesus Christ is alive and that he's coming back, our hope is in the coming kingdom of God, not in this kingdom. And what happens when we witness is we suffer loss. There will be people who reject us, people who are appalled by us. We see this in the world. I would argue to you, our most effective days for gospel witness is in the coming dark days ahead of us as a society. Because the more combative society gets, the darker it gets, the brighter the light of the gospel is. But we must be prepared to suffer loss. We read Hebrews and we see brothers and sisters who suffered great loss, but they're not crying today about it. They're doing a little bit better than we are. 
We must be willing to suffer loss for the cause of Christ. To be a true witness for Christ, there will be suffering involved. But I will also say this. Last thing I will say to you is this. If we're to be true witnesses for Christ, it will be because we are participating in the work of prayer. Prayer becomes a giant theme through the book of Acts, uh, especially when we get to chapter 2 and following. And oftentimes when we think of prayer, we think of something that we do uh, pre-dinner where we pray for the, you know, the greasy pizza we're about to eat, that God would turn it into carrot sticks and nourish it to our bodies, right? That's what we say. Or we pray before a Sunday school lesson or pray before a service. Nothing wrong with any of those things, but the reality is prayer is not a preliminary thing that we do. Prayer is an actual work that we should be engaged in. As a matter of fact, it says that in Acts chapter 6, verse 4. As the church was growing rapidly, they called some deacons, seven brothers to themselves. And here's the words they said. They said, we need you to help us because we must continue to give ourselves to the work of the ministry of the word and the work of the ministry of prayer. That word prayer is not a verb. It's a noun in the singular feminine form. It means a work. In other words, when we participate in the work of prayer, God begins to work. Oftentimes we talk about the power of prayer, and it's not wrong to say that, but really what we should be talking about is the power of God that is initiated in, the, in prayer. We think of 1 Kings chapter 17, and we see Elijah there dealing with the prophets of Baal. And it's there on the mountain that they're crying out to their pagan God and they're cutting themselves and they're bleeding. It's a gross scene. It's pathetic and nasty. And Paul says, maybe you should yell louder. Maybe he's asleep. And then Paul cries out to his God. And fire comes down from heaven and consumes the altars. Do you know what doesn't happen next? The prophets of Baal don't say, man, Elijah, you're a really good prayer guy. What a good prayer, you said. You're such a good prayer. No. Everyone who was there on that mountain said, there is one powerful God. Because the reality is that's comforting to us because I, I've, I've said some foolish prayers in my life. I know some of you have. I've heard them. <laughs> A lot of our prayers are theologically incorrect, to be honest. But it's not about our etiquette and our words. It's about communing with the God who has all the power. And when we'll do the work of prayer, God will rain down his spirit and his fire. And he will do things through us that we could never hope or even imagine would happen. That's the story of this book, isn't it? That as the people gave themselves in witness, empowered by the work of prayer, God got the gospel all the way to us. Last Sunday, uh, some of you were here. It was only this service. I didn't do it in any other service. Um, at the end of the service, I just felt led. I just really felt impressed. God doesn't speak to me audibly. I think that's... You know, I'm not, whatever. I, but he, he does impress things on my heart sometimes. And I just felt led at the end of the sermon. I, I, I said, I, I just want, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to make this like a VBS thing, whatever, heads bowed, everybody was closed. I, I, I just said to myself, I said, I said, you need to press in. And I just really felt led by the Lord that it was somebody here that needed to be saved. So I, you, you remember if you were, I asked, and I didn't do this in any other service, the only service I did. I said, would you just like, you know, maybe raise your hand. I'd like to pray with you. And nobody raised their hand. I was really discouraged. You know, two, two reasons. Uh, it could have been that I preached a really bad sermon, right? That happens a lot. Or it could be that Baptists are liars, and I think it's probably both. Because <laughs> I know that there was lost people. I know there's lost people in the room right now. So I was really discouraged. I knew it wasn't true that everybody in the room was saved, but but I, and I, and I, just, I couldn't, that burden, that, that's why I was sad. There was a burden there because I knew, I knew somebody. I just really felt that somebody needed to pray to receive Christ. So I asked uh, all of you, which I wish would just be a pattern of our church. It's not, but I wish it was. If you'd consider joining at the altar and praying because we should be doing the work of prayer. Our witness is ineffective without the work of prayer. Should we pray for lost people? And, and so this happened. This, this, I didn't know this until after church. Uh, so I asked that, and um, 
Uh, my wife and one of her friends, they come down. There's a bunch of people down here praying. And, um, and, and, and her friend asked if they could just pray for uh, her children because uh, I think two, maybe just one, I'm not sure, uh, but two of her children don't know Christ yet. So, um, so they're, that's what they're praying. Now, long story short, uh, that child that they were praying for was not at church. He was homesick. And they actually watched the sermon online. Most people would never do that, but they did. So they were watching the sermon online. I asked the question, would you raise your hand? And there in the living room of their home, um, uh, a child raised his hand. They're, they're praying. At the same time, they're praying. And the dad, of course, is a Baptist, so he didn't have his eyes closed. He was looking around the room <laughs> while he should have had his eyes closed. So he saw, he saw his son had his hand in the air. He's like, do you, do you want to be saved? And so that dad had the privilege of sharing the plan of salvation and leading his son to faith in Christ. Now, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I know what the Bible says. I, I've read it a few times. I, maybe we'll get a manual in heaven or something. And I, I don't know how the providence of God and the sovereignty of God and all that stuff works together. The apostle Paul seems quite confused about it as well in the book of Romans. He's just writing down what the spirit tells him to write down. But I do know this. When we will do the work of prayer, God will pour out his fire on us. While they were praying, and I was discouraged because God had laid it on my heart that someone should be saved. A little boy in a living room miles from here was raising his hand. How many of us in this room, let's be honest, we have loved ones that we know would bust hell wide open today refused to do the work of prayer. You see, the baton was passed to us 2,000 years ago. And Jesus even promised the Spirit would empower that work. But will we do the work? Will we continue to do what God has called us to do? And oh, by the way, I, I am convinced of this. If we will do what God has called us to do, he will do things through us that we could never hope or imagine. God, we love you. And Lord, we praise you. And Lord, we give you this moment. And Lord, I pray that you'd find us faithful. God, we know that you're away right now and we long for you to come back. But while you're away, Lord, I pray that we would not be caught standing around looking as the disciples were in that moment, but that we'd be found faithful. Faithfully doing the work of the ministry, fulfilling the obligation of your people, the body of Christ, and that we would do the work of prayer so that when we witness, fire would come down. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we sing this song together?